everybody. Today I'm down on the shoreline of Utah Lake in, in Utah County of the state of Utah. That's a lot of Utahs. <laughs> this is my home state and this is my home territory actually. I grew up in this valley on the shores of Utah Lake, playing along the edge of the lake, wading in the swamps, water skiing, all sorts of stuff on this lake. It's the middle of winter. It's, a, it's about six days before Christmas. The lake is frozen, not completely solid. I wouldn't want to walk out on it, but there's some nice ice. No big ice flows yet, which was what I was hoping to come photograph. Just some spectacular views across the lake here of the Wasatch Mountains. You can see from north to south, you can see the Lone Peak area, Timpanogos, Cascade Mountain, uh, Provo Peak, Provo Ridge, Mapleton Mountain, and back here behind me, um, Lofer Mountain and further around on the other side of this this hill behind me, Mount Nebo. It's just a spectacular area to, to photograph across the lake. It's one of my favorite spots. I was hoping to have some bigger ice flows in here, but hey, what the heck. So today I'm going to talk to you about aperture on your lens. If you watched my video about photographing in manual, I'll put a link to it right up there. I go over this briefly. I want to delve into a little bit more today about what the aperture is used for, the importance of getting the correct aperture, and what aperture actually is. A lot of people refer to the aperture as the f-stop, which is perfectly fine. If you look at this lens, this is the back opening, otherwise known as where the aperture is. That's opened all the way up at 2.8, the maximum it can open up to. As I start closing it down to 4, to 5, 6, you know, to 8, to 11, and there's 22, the higher the number gets, the smaller the hole gets. This is extremely important to understand when you're shooting in manual. Wide open on a lens is the widest opening the aperture can go to. This one's 2.8. Most kit lenses will open up to like 3.5 or 5.6, maybe 4.0. So having 2.8 is actually really nice, especially for nighttime photography. The smaller it gets, the less light is allowed in. The wider it is, the more light is allowed in. This is extremely important when you're photographing and understanding depth of field. Depth of field is what is going to be in focus in front of and behind of the plane you were focused on. The plane as in like where you're focused, not the airplane that's flying overhead right now. <laughs> so if you hold your finger out in front of you like this and focus on it, you'll notice everything behind it is out of focus. If you focus on everything in the back, your finger will be out of focus. That is depth of field in essence. How you set the aperture on your lens determines what will be in focus in front of and behind of what you focused on. In this instance, my finger, if I'm photographing that with my camera and I focus on my finger and I have it wide open, everything in front of and behind what I'm focused on, being my finger, will be out of focus. If I stop it all the way down, it's called stopping it down as a photography term. If I stop it all the way down to 22, then I focus on my finger, depending on the lens and depending on how far away my finger is, there's some other things that are involved in this, but if I set it on 22, focus on my finger, that mountain back there will be more in focus because it was set at 22 at the smallest aperture. You can adjust anywhere in between those to get it in focus more or out of focus more. It really depends on the lens and how close the front object is to, is to you versus the object in the back. There's, it's not just a cut and dried rule. There's some other things that go into it, but it really is a matter of playing around with your lens, your camera, and figuring out how it's gonna work. So let me photograph some stuff here and show you some examples. You know, there's, there's nothing worse than going to shoot and realizing you don't have a, a SD card in your camera. <laughs> uh, the one I usually use is at home. Wait, that's not where it goes. And then not knowing where it goes in your camera. <laughs> All right, that's gonna be better. 
So what I'm really interested in here is this view of Temp, of Tempanogus, that we, we call it Temp here, um, and being able to compose this. You know, I could go more wide angle, but then the mountain is just so far out there, and if the mountain's gonna be the subject, then I really need to determine how this is gonna be composed. So for this purpose, I'm going to include a little bit of this rock in the foreground because I want the mountain to show that it's towering over the valley. Let's see here. You know, probably something like that right there. So to get everything in focus, I could focus on infinity out there, just on the mountain, way out there in the distance and set my aperture all the way, the smallest it'll go at 22. Then I have to change my shutter speed to bring the meter in. Always check with your histogram how the exposure is, because there's a lot of white here. You're never quite sure how it's gonna come out. It could come out underexposed. Now I know my camera and how I've got it set, so that's pretty good. You can see how sharp the foreground is versus the background. I've focused out there on infinity and I've set my aperture at 22, which is gonna make everything in focus within reason in the foreground. The background is not a problem. It's this, this close up objects that I'm worried about. Now watch what happens if I'm still focused out there on the background and I go to the extreme of opening up my, my lens all the way up. This is my 28 to 70 lens, and if I open it all the way up to 2.8, watch how out of focus the stuff in the foreground is going to be. Now, when you're doing this, you have to remember to keep. <laughs> yeah, and look what happened. I have a totally whitewashed out image <laughs> because I wasn't checking my meter. I wasn't watching the meter in the camera. I opened it up to 2.8, but I didn't change the shutter speed to compensate for that. <laughs> so that's pretty funny. Look at that. My image is completely washed out white because I left the shutter speed at 50 and I opened the lens all the way up to 2.8. So you see the meter right there, it's totally overexposed. I gotta change the shutter speed up a bunch. See the meter starts to come down, come down, come down. I've gotta put the shutter speed wide open at one three hundred, one three hundred, one, one, one thirty two hundred. 130, I can't even say that, 132 hundredth of a second. <laughs> All right, so now with my camera settings set right, you can see the histogram looks good. Now I can zoom in on it to 100% to really take a look at it. The background is nice and sharp, but as I come in here and start to look at the ice in front of me, it starts to get more and more soft and really soft and the stuff, I mean really soft and the stuff right here in the foreground, the rocks, they're totally out of focus. That's depth of field, being able to control that. So this is with it wide open at 2.8 and this is with it closed all the way down to 22. And as you zoom in on the 22 one, background is still nice. The foreground is sharp. It's not tack sharp in the very, very stuff in front because depth of field can only do so much, but it's pretty good. So, you know, that is how you control the depth of field and getting things in sharp up close and far away. There is another way of doing this, which I've talked about briefly in that other video. Um, <laughs> what, 
which is the more common way of doing it nowadays. It's called focus stacking, where you focus on the foreground and take a picture, focus out in the middle and take a picture, and then focus in the background and take a picture, and then merge them all together in Photoshop. That's a lesson for another day. I'm gonna to get to that after this lesson. So after this episode, my next episode is gonna be about focus stacking. So look forward to that one. <laughs> so the biggest part of getting great photographs is understanding how to control things like your shutter speed, your aperture, the f-stop so you can get a good depth of field, the ISO. I've been talking about this in this series. The aperture plays a really big part in how this all works. It really is important to understand how to set your aperture so that you can get the results you want with what is in focus and with what is out of focus. For instance, look at this cool rock. Look at how the water has washed over it and is frozen. It's even wrapping around that edge. Let's say I wanted to photograph that and I didn't want the stuff in the background to be in focus. This ice, this whole ice through here is actually really cool. The light's starting to die and there's a lot I could photograph right here. I'm gonna set up and photograph this and show you how to get a really shallow depth of field with the artistic look of just having what I want in focus. So I'm gonna set up here and compose this. Get my focus all dialed in there. This shot is really about that cool ice and how it's coming off of the, the rock there. This light is just so perfect as it's starting to die. I think I'm gonna come in a little bit tighter. Really get that focus dialed in there. So I'm shooting that at f8 at 60th of a second at ISO 100. So now if I come in, histogram looks really nice. So now if I come in and zoom in on that to check it, the background is nice and soft, the rock, and the ice flowing off of that is pretty sharp. Yeah, that's not bad. I might be able to dial it in a little bit better. And I could do that by maybe going to F10, check my focus. Take another one. Histogram still looks really good. That light is really starting to die. It's a perfect time. Yeah, that night that ice is nice and all that flow looks really good now. And the background is not distracting. It's not it's soft and not distracting. If the background was nice and sharp, let me show you. I'll shut that all the way down to 22. Then I have to go at eighth of a second. That light is dying. And now if I look at the background, it's quite a bit sharper. It's not gonna be totally dead sharp without focus stacking, which I'll get to next week. <laughs> but it's pretty good. That light's going into a cloud and I'm getting too old for this crap. It's gonna hurt to stand up. I hope you enjoyed this little tutorial on aperture, f-stop. They're interchangeable terms. I, I prefer to use aperture because f-stop can be a little bit confusing what f-stop stands for is focal length. The f stands for the focal length of your lens. So f-stop, the focal length stop, the stop is 
you know, describing the aperture opening in essence, but a lot of times people will use f-stop interchangeable or stop interchangeable. Like if I'm changing the shutter speed from say 1 30th of a second to a 60th of a second, I would refer to that as a one stop change. And so it really, the terminology can really confuse people um, that are getting new into photography. So I'm trying to make it simple and use terms aperture, shutter, ISO. So with that said, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this little tutorial. And as I like to say at the end of my videos, happy trails. I got to get out of here. My wife's going to wonder where I am. Woo.